And thank you, Michael. Well, today, um, as Mike said, we're going to jump into this scripture from Luke 2. Uh, verses 41 to 52 that he just read for us. We're going to unpack this for you. I want to welcome all of you, first of all. Uh, glad to see everybody here. My name is Daniel, and I serve as pastor here at Woodlands. Hello, hello, hello. Got some, got some, got some cute people that are waving at me. Very, very nice. Yeah, but none of y'all going to be as cute as the little girls dancing down here during worship, all right? Can I just tell you? Um, oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, they just light me up every week. Um, and, uh, but anyway, I want to say welcome to the online guests as well. So glad you all have tuned in, whether you're live or whether you're watching later on demand. And uh, if you're a visitor today, if you're here for the first time, or if you're watching online for the first time, we just want to give you a special welcome, let you know that we're really, really glad that you've uh, uh, tuned in, check this out, uh, because it's, uh, uh, you, you made a good choice today. It's, this is going to be a, uh, it's already been a fun day, and it's going to be even a more fun day as we move on. Um, we're get, we continue our series now called Under Construction. And if you're here in person, you can see why we chose this topic, because we are under construction physically, and we are under construction spiritually as individuals. And uh, this is a study of the Gospel of Luke, a study of the Gospel of Luke. Now, all of the Gospels in the Bible, there's four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and those four Gospels are simply biographies of the life of Jesus. And the authors are the ones whose, whose uh, names that we cite as their gospel. We're looking at the gospel of Luke. So let's uh, jump into Luke chapter uh, 2, verse 41. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Uh, this is from God's Word translation. It says, every year, every year, every year, Jesus' parents would go to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Now, the first thing that we see here, right out of the gate, is that the parents of Jesus, Mary and Joseph, that they were very responsible parents. They were very responsible. Um, Jesus is now 12 years old, all right? The last time we saw Jesus, he was eight days old, and he was being dedicated in the temple. We hear nothing about his life. There's nothing recorded about him until this event at 12 years old. And they're taking him to Jerusalem. Now, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, and by now they had other children as well, they lived in Nazareth. And it was just a little tiny town, and, uh, but it was about a three-day journey walking from Nazareth to get to Jerusalem. And they were heading there for the Passover feast. See, there were three major uh, festivals, if you will, that um, all good Jewish families made an effort to come to Jerusalem for. And those, those three festivals were the Feast of Tabernacles, then there was the Feast of Pentecost, and then the Feast of Passover. Now, because of the distance of the travel, because of the expense involved with all of this, it's possible that families all around Jerusalem would not make it to all three of those festivals in a year. But everybody tried to make it to Passover. This was the big one. Passover was our Christmas, right? I mean, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're a Christian, you celebrate Christmas, okay? And, and for the Jewish uh, uh, people, they made sure they celebrated Passover, and you had to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. I mean, so the, the population of the city would swell two to three times its normal size uh, during the Passover festival. So let me ask you, parents, how are you doing as a parent? Grandparents, how are you doing uh, in, in that line? Are you, are you making sure your kids get to church every Sunday? You see, Mary and Joseph were very consistent. They got their children, their family, to the Passover feast. They would go to synagogue every week in their hometown, but then when it came time for the festivals, they would come uh, to the festival on a regular annual basis. Um, let me ask those of you who are online, how are you watching this online? Is it just kind of on in the background while you, everybody's scurrying around doing their own thing? Or do you set this time aside? Do you tell the kids to come in, sit down, turn off the phones, and everybody pays attention throughout the course of the service? And then when it's over, you take a few minutes to discuss, hey, what did you learn today? What did you get out of this today? Um, are, are you aware parents, grandparents, of the impact that your friends will have on your children. 
Are you aware just how much your friends will influence your kids? You see, there's a saying that goes like this. You are now, or soon will be, just like those you spend the most time with. You are now, or soon will be, just like those you said. That's true for adults as well as for children, as well as for teenagers, as well as for college students. You want to know why so many kids go off to college and go off the deep end? You want to know why? Because that's who they're hanging out with, all right? And that's why there's a lot of great college ministries. When you send your children off to school, do not send your children to a school where there is not a solid college Christian ministry that's uh, happening there because you want to make sure your kids get in with a good group of kids who have similar goals, okay? This is very, very important. Joseph and Mary understood this. They understood this because of the tradition and, and the, um, of going to the festivals, of going to synagogue, of keeping their family together. Dads, let me ask you something. Dads, do you allow the young man dating your daughter to sit in the driveway and honk for her to come, right? Or do you allow him to shoot a text and say, I'm here, right? I see several guys going, "Huh, uh you know what? I trust those men right there. I'd trust those men with my daughter if I had one, which I don't. But I do have granddaughters, so I'd trust those men with my granddaughters. Uh, you see... It is disrespectful to sit in the driveway and honk and expect a girl to come running out. That is flat out disrespectful. And if, that's right, amen. And if this young man is going to disrespect your daughter in a simple thing like that, how else is he going to disrespect her? All right? E.V. Hill was a great preacher. He passed away several years ago. You can still listen to his sermons online. Wonderful, wonderful, godly man. And he tells a story about this, about his daughter who was getting ready to leave on a date, and it was one of her first dates. And uh, the guy came to the drive, near the driveway and honked the horn. And she starts running out the door. And he's like, wait, wait, wait. He had one of these voices like, wait, 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 wait a minute. Where do you think you're going, young lady? You know, well, my, you know, my, my date said, no, 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 no. He said, you come here and sit right down. And she had to come back in and sit right down. Was, but, he, but he's waiting on me. He can just keep waiting. He can just keep waiting. And uh, basically, what you have is a situation, will your daughter feel awkward? Yes, she will. Will the young man feel awkward about having to get up and come in and meet you? Most likely he will. But here's the thing. You get a young man who will follow your rules, you just might have a winner. All right? So very, very important. If he, um, either way, parents, we have to take responsibility, which is what we see here with Mary and Joseph. Get your kids to Woodlands as many times as possible, as often as possible, every Sunday if possible, from their birth all the way through their teen years. And if, you're, if you've got an online uh, system going, make sure that time is set aside as a special time. People aren't just helter-skelter walking around doing this, doing that, and it's just noise in the background. No, we need to sit down and worship God. We, need, we, we, we owe it to God to give Him our attention, right? So, um, let me take it one step further, all right? And this, this actually might be a little controversial, but hey, what fun is it having me as your pastor if I'm not controversial once in a while, right? I mean, it's just kind of what I do. Because many children today grow up, and children sometimes, as they graduate high school, they choose to, you know, take this flex year that uh, a lot of kids take. They're, they're not going to go right away to college or, you know, they, they don't want to go, you know, right away into the workforce, that kind of thing. So you've got, you've got older, older teenagers who are still at home. You also have teenagers uh, who are boomerang kids, right? They go away, maybe they go away to college or maybe they go away to do something else, and then they boomerang. Next thing you know, they're back in your house. You know, it's like, I thought you left. You're back already? 
Okay, it's been four years. You're kidding me, you know. And so, and and so, you, you've got this. You've got this dynamic. Here's what. Here's my point. If you have children living in your house, those children should come to your church. Now, I know that's a little controversial, and I know some of y'all might be like, "Well, pastor, you don't understand." No, this comes from the Word of God. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm sure, I'm, this, is how, this is how godly men and godly women, okay, mothers and fathers, and it's like, well, you don't understand. They're a little older. They need to make their own decisions. Yeah, of course they need to make their own decisions. Of course they need to decide for themselves, you know, what, what, you know, what they do and where they work and this kind of thing. But on Sunday, our family goes to church. So if you're living in my house, you come to my church. Well, okay, they could go to a different church. It's not really about which church they go to. The important point is that they go to church, right? If they're living in your house, they should be going to church. Now they say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm I'm not even sure I'm a Christian. I don't even know if I want to go to church. That's okay. You don't have to be a Christian to go to church. What a teachable moment, right? You don't have to be a Christian to go to church, but you do need to go to church because you're, no, I'm not going to go. Is that right? Let me show you the door. You are an adult. You can make your own decisions. And your decisions are simple. Get in church or (laughs) go find some place else to live. You know, now some of y'all, some of y'all are afraid, you know, you're going to, you know, upset your children and they're not going to like you anymore. They're going to come back. All right. All right. Be the mom, be the dad. Okay, that, and that's very important. Now, that's a little, now, like I said, that's a little controversial, but I think it's something that people need to think about, all right? Because adolescence is being delayed in our generation. Therefore, we need to continue to parent our children even though they're past high school age. That's the real teachable moment coming out of this, all right? And if some of you are like shooting darts at me right now, man. You're just, I'm not sure I like that, Pastor. That's okay. I still love you. I promise. And you still love me. I know you do. Um, here, here, here's what we got to remember. The number one rule of parenting, and that is more is caught than taught. More is caught than taught. Your kids will value the things that they see you value. What they see you value, they will value. So today we kick off our small groups, all right? We kick off our small groups, very excited about this. Mike Ross has done an outstanding job uh, putting this uh, ministry together. We have a whole bunch of small groups he's going to you know, talk about right at the end here. He'll wrap things up and then dismiss you all to go get signed up for your small group. Um, but here, you know, will you model, the question is, when it comes to small groups, will you model for your children... Will you model for your grandchildren um, the, the value of being in community? You see, that's our number one value here at Woodlands. We have eight core values here at Woodlands. We don't really put them in order, but the first one is um, community. And we believe that the number one way to accomplish community is through small groups. That's why small groups are so important to us here at Woodlands. And will you show the value of a small group to the point where you show your children, you show your grandchildren that one night a week, one night a week, you're going to step away from the TV. You're going to step away from the computer. You're going to shut the phone off. And you'll spend just a couple hours, just two hours, probably not even that long, hour and a half, two hours, in fellowship with other Christian men, other Christian women, where you can be, like Teresa talked about, energized, recharged. You know, I mean, you're here on Sunday, which is great. I'm so proud of y'all for being here on Sunday. That's fantastic. Those of you watching online, super proud of you for that. But, I mean, everybody knows the battery. I mean, the battery starts losing its charge, you know? So you need a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday pick-me-up, right? To kind of get you fired up again and get that spiritual recharge. This is what Jesus saw and caught from his earthly parents. They were consistently worshiping God. Verse 42, when Jesus was 12 years old, they went as usual. They went as usual. This was just part of their routine. They had been doing it since Jesus was born. He didn't know any different. And that's why it's so important to get your children in church as soon as possible. All right? Some parents say this. 
and they've said this for years. Some parents say, well, I'm going to wait till my kids are a little older, and then I'm going to let them choose. No, because of the developmental process of children, if you don't take them to church, you've already chosen for them by not giving them that experience. No, you need, to, you, need to let you, you need to bring your kids as early as possible. And it's just what we do as a family. I was born on a Sunday. I was in church the next Sunday. And I basically didn't miss church after that. In fact, in my church growing up, these were, I wish I still had this, but I don't. We had these pins, these, these, these annual... Uh, 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 Sunday school attendance pins. And, and you got the first one, and the second one was a wreath that went around it. And then you got these bars that went down. You almost felt military, you know? And, and I had a string of these that went all the way from, from, from kindergarten through 12th grade, all right? And you, you could miss two Sundays a year, by the way, and still get what was called a perfect attendance pin. Never missed more than two Sundays in my entire life. Um, and... My mom and my dad, they were in church every Sunday with me, you know. Now, y'all can look at me and say, well, if my kids are going to turn out like that, I'd rather have nothing, you know, to do with church. I don't know, okay? Um, but, but, but what I will tell you, what I will tell you is that was absolutely formative in, in where I am. And, and in my life, you know, I've, I've followed the Lord all my life, all my life. Guys, I've never had a time of rebellion in my life. I never had a time where I walked away from the Lord, okay? I had no desire whatsoever to experiment with drugs or drinking or sex in any way, shape, or form. And quite frankly, um, my other siblings were all, you know, uh, somewhat the same way. My two boys are really very much the same way. They've never rebelled against their mom and dad, and they've, and they've grown up to be very, very, you know, successful, godly men. Um, and, you know, we can't take a lot of credit for that. You know, that's God. But it's putting them in that environment. Now, it's not just being in church. It's got to go way beyond that. That's why the small group is so important, because they start seeing it's a lifestyle when you show up at church every Sunday, and you go to a small group. Oh, okay, this is more than just a Sunday routine, right? So, what was happening with Jesus was, 12 years old, he went as usual, and, 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 and uh, the, the interesting thing here, one of the interesting dynamics of this is, Luke points out that Jesus was 12 years old. You see, a Jewish boy came to manhood at the age of 13, if this had been a made-up story, he would have put Jesus at 13. See what I'm saying? So by, by acknowledging that he was only 12 and not 13, we see that this is an authentic story, a, a, a true story being told by Luke. Because he was making it up, he never would have put him at 12 years old. He would have put him at 13. You see, at puberty... Recognized at the age of 13 for first century Christian, I'm sorry, first century Jewish boy, at that point he would officially become, and here's the phrase, a son of the covenant. A son of the covenant. Now, the co what's the covenant? Well, the covenant, we talk about the Old Covenant, which is the Old Testament. We've talked about this before. The word testament and covenant are synonymous. Okay, so the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, or what's called the Jewish Scriptures. Then we have the New Covenant, right? The New Testament. And so what would happen with a boy at the age of 13 is he would go through what today is called a bar mitzvah. And some of you probably heard that term. Maybe you've had friends. Maybe you've even been to a bar mitzvah of a friend who was Jewish. This was celebrated by every Jewish boy at 13, on their 13th birthday. But here's the thing. The term bar mitzvah did not become standard in the Jewish community until 500 years after Jesus was raised from the dead. But the idea and the celebration still took place. Okay, At age 13, here's what happened. A boy became accountable for his actions, and he becomes a, quote, bar mitzvah, which means an agent who is subject to the law. Because that's what the word that bar means. Bar means under the category or subject to. That's what bar means. As a matter of fact, there's a name in the, in the Bible, Simon Bar-Jonah. And the word bar, it means son of, but literally it means under the authority of, 
okay? So bar, under the authority, and then mitzvah, subject to the law. So verse 43, when the festival was over, <clears throat> Passover, they left for home. The boy, Jesus, stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents didn't know it. And y'all probably thinking, Pastor, didn't you just tell us how responsible these parents were? <laughs> I mean, what lousy parents, right? <laughs> you, you leave the kid behind in the big city? But here's the thing that we need to understand the context of the first century. It was traveling by foot in the open country was very dangerous in the first century. Thieves, robbers, vagabonds. So people always traveled in groups, in caravans, when they had to go from one place to another. This was for support, and this was for protection. The men typically walked together, and the women and children typically walked together. Some of you are starting to put this together, aren't you? You're starting to put this together. Verse 44, they thought that he was with the others, they, Mary and Joseph, thought he was with the others, they had other relatives with them, other people from their village of Nazareth, who were traveling with them. You know how kids are when they get in junior high, right? I mean, they want to hang out with their friends, right? I, mean, I remember my kids, when they started getting late elementary age and junior high, oh, can so-and-so come over? Oh, can I go play at somebody's house? They, they're, they're extremely social at this age. Jesus would have been no different. After traveling for a day, though, they started to look for Jesus among their relatives and friends. You know, I mean, it's time, we've been walking all day, it's time to eat. The boy never misses a meal, right? I mean, when you've hit puberty, boys can eat you out of house and home. You know what I'm talking about? And, and, and so, I mean, at this point, they've got to be thinking, we're, so at 12 years old, Jesus, he would have been right on the cusp of being a man. But technically, he was still a child. It's not too hard to imagine Joseph would have thought, as a child, he was with Mary and the other children, where Mary would maybe very well be thinking, I mean, the boy's 12, he's on the cusp of manhood, he's just sneaking up there and hanging out with the men, because all kids want to grow up faster than they should. You know what I'm talking about? Um, so, so they may have quietly, as husband and wife, been blaming each other for the guilt that they were feeling about losing their son. Now, I don't know, maybe we're all a bunch of perfect husbands and wives here, but I'm sure there have been times, I, there have definitely been times in my marriage where something has gone wrong, and I'm over there thinking, Ruthie, you should have, duh, 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 duh. and Ruth's probably looking at me going, Daniel, if you just would have, duh, 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 duh. and there's something like that might have been going on right here. Joseph could very well be thinking, what kind of mother loses the Son of God? Right? I mean, who does that? I mean, Joseph, in his mind, he's thinking, if there's one rule, Mary, it's make sure the Savior's in the caravan. Okay? And then Mary, you know where she's coming from, ladies. You know what she's, she's shooting the old dart eyes over there at Joseph. You know, and she's, oh, I know he's looking at me. I know he blames me for this, but he's the man, right? I mean, he should be taking care of the family. It's his son. I mean, how could he leave his son in the city? I mean, do I have to do everything? Can I get an amen, ladies? Can I get an amen, right? I mean, I, I, I packed up the tent. I, I made breakfast. I put together the sandwiches for the journey. I mean, the least he could have done was kept his eye on the boy. Verse 45, when they didn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. They're a day out. So they're hustling back. Have you ever lost a child? Anybody ever lost a child? Come on now. I lost a child. <laughs> My wife and I lost a child. We were moving. We lived in Elgin. It's just northwest of here. We were moving from Elgin to South Elgin into a new home. And we had friends there, trucks and everything. We were just moving ourselves. And, you know, everything packed up. And we headed across town. And we got things unloaded. And, we, and you know, well, where's our boys? You know, we find, we find Travis, our youngest. He's there. Where's Brian? 
Brian, where, where's Brian? We look all around the new house. We look outside. No Brian. All of a sudden, it dawns on us. <gasps> we left him. <laughs> He's in the other house. I hop in the car and fly across town, breaking every traffic law known to humankind. Get over there as fast as I can, pull in the driveway, screech the brakes, go running in. I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what's happened? I mean, he's there by himself. Is he panicked? Is he worried? Is he, is, you know, is, is he feeling alone? Is he crying? Maybe he's hurt himself. Oh my gosh, what if he hurt himself? What if he's bleeding somewhere? Oh my gosh, he's bleeding out somewhere, you know? And so, and so I run inside, Brian, 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 and I go flying up the steps. I go to his bedroom. I swing the door open, and he's like, Ugh. And he and his friend Colin are sitting in the middle of the, of the room playing Legos. They didn't even know we left. But I can tell you, it was sheer panic during that time till I found Brian. Verse 46, three days later. Three days later. Can you imagine Mary, nighttime comes. They haven't found him. Where is he? Is he on the street? Has he been kidnapped? What if somebody beat him or abused him? And he's bloody and he's laying in an alley somewhere. You try to get some sleep, but you can't sleep. You get up and you keep searching first thing in the morning. You search all day long. It's now two days. Nighttime comes again. You still haven't found the boy. God's son. Finally, finally, they found him in the temple courtyard. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them, asking them questions. His understanding and his answers stunned everyone who heard him. You see, this would become the norm with Jesus any time that he would speak to people publicly. People were always amazed with what he had to say because he was one who spoke with authority and not like their teachers of the law. Verse 48, when his parents saw him, they were shocked. And that word there, it has this meaning of, of astonished and, and there's, this, there's this connotation of being at their wit's end. I imagine so, don't you? His mother asked him, Son, why have you done this to us? And, and that's probably understated as to how she said it. Your father and I have been worried sick looking for you. That phrase, worried sick, it comes from the Greek word adonao, because you know the New Testament was originally written in Greek. We translate it to English. But when you look at that word in its original context, it has this, 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 this meaning of, of distress and, and being frantic, of great pain and suffering. Mary is at her wit's end. She is losing it. I mean, she is stressed out. She hasn't slept. She probably hasn't eaten in 72 hours. Joseph the same way. Most parents have lost a child, at least for a few minutes, right? I mean, at least uh, in the grocery store, they run around the other side, or you're at the, at the mall, and, and they crawl under the clothes rack, you know? You, you had a kid do that? Yeah, mine both did that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you? Mary and Joseph, it was three days, and they were raising God. Verse 49, Jesus said to them, Why were you looking for me? Didn't you realize I had to be in my father's house? Uh, that phrase can also be translated about my father's business. The first thing to realize here, folks, is these are the first recorded words of Jesus. These are the first words that anybody in history has ever heard him speak since the first century. We all know these words that came from this 12-year-old boy. The phrase, my father, you got your Bible out, 
You want to underline that? You get your smartphone or tablet, highlight that. My father. That's very, very unique for a, a Jewish boy in the first century. It's essentially the climax of the entire passage. It is the first instance in Luke of Jesus' awareness of his unique relationship as the Son of God. You see, Jewish people didn't say, my father. Jewish people always said, our father. And usually it was our father in heaven. Jesus says, didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? Jesus knew that his relationship to his father was personal and that the mission that he would give his life to was the same mission as his father's. At this point, we know Jesus knew he and the father were one. Today, our kids need this too. Our kids need to know their mom and their dad love them. They need to know that we're of the same heart and same mind. They need to know that we're all pulling, we're all rowing in the same direction. Ideally, ideally, mom and dad will model the love of the Heavenly Father to their children. An unconditional love that doles out discipline when necessary. But discipline is love. And if you're disciplining or punishing a child and it's not coming out of love, then you shouldn't be doing it. But way too often, here's the problem, right? Because of the absenteeism or just good old-fashioned self-centeredness of men, kids don't learn the love of God from dad far too often. That burden usually falls only on mom's shoulders. But what happens if mom doesn't show the love of God either? And some of you here today, in all likelihood, grew up in a home where nobody at home was demonstrating the love of God to you. Oh, I'm so glad you found the church because that's what we're here for as the church, to show you, to demonstrate God's love to you. You see, if you haven't heard it lately, we love you. I love you. I love you dearly. And the church of Jesus Christ will always, always, always love you. And it doesn't matter how far away you move. And it doesn't matter what bad things you may have done. Oh, sure, there will be personal consequences for those things that you'll have to deal with. Some of those consequences you'll deal with the rest of your life. But you need to know that as a church, we love you. Are you watching online? We haven't even met some of you yet. But I promise you, there's enough love here at Woodlands for you. Every one of you have a purpose. Every single one of you were born for a purpose. You have a purpose and a destiny that God has planned for you. There are four steps that we talk about here to display this, to know God, to find freedom, to discover purpose and make a difference. And we want to help you walk that journey. And that's why we offer the growth track here at Woodlands. We've been doing it for a while. However, it took a hiatus during, during the COVID shutdown. I am happy to announce to you today that growth track begins again in October. Amen. So if you have never taken growth track at Woodlands, then you need to put that on your schedule. And at this point, it's going to happen right after the service. It goes for an hour and 15 minutes. Child care will be provided. And we invite you to come and be part of growth track so you can be sure what it means to know God personally. So you can find freedom. Freedom from your past lifestyle. Freedom from past sins. Freedom from past sins that others have committed against you. So that you can discover your purpose. You can know your why. 
Why am I here? Why do I exist? What, what, why am I even alive? And ultimately, you can make a difference because every single one of you make a difference. And you have a call on your life to make a difference in a way that you've been wired to do. Now, this is also our pathway to membership. Um, you don't have to become a member going through Woodlands. As a matter of fact, if you don't really want to become a member, you may think, well, I don't want to do that. No, no, no. If you're going to be part of Woodlands, even if you're not going to become a member right away, or maybe ever, I still want you to go through Growth Track so that we can be in alignment one with another. And you can know what is expected of you as someone who attends Woodlands regularly. Okay, so we start 1st of October. It meets 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Sundays. Um, of October. So we invite you to be t- participate in that. Jesus had just said, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? Verse 50, but they didn't understand what he meant. They didn't understand. Mary and Joseph, despite the miraculous announcement of Gabriel telling Mary that she was going to be the mother of God. Folks, 12 years had passed. 12 years of normal, ordinary life. I mean, Jesus, no, he was human. He was 100% human in many ways, except for the fact the kid never sinned. I've thought about that. (laughs) Some of you have too. Life had just been, well, normal. Verse 51, Then he returned with them to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. It's the second time we've heard that Mary treasured these things in her heart. You see, how did we get such detailed emotional information? Remember, Luke says that his gospel, that he cites only eyewitnesses in everything that he writes. That's why we can trust every word of the Bible. Because the writers of Scripture only speak only spoke to and got their information from eyewitnesses, those who saw it firsthand. In all likelihood, Luke met Mary later in life. And that's the only way we could have this level of detail from someone who was there. So as we read Luke's words, understand that we are most likely reading the retelling of Mary's personal experience. Now, how powerful is that? Verse 52, Jesus grew in wisdom and maturity. He gained favor from God and people. Uh, this verse has been the basis of all kinds of, of uh, you know, books and curriculum. There's a curriculum called 252, Luke 252, 252 curriculum by a company named Orange. We've done their curriculum here. It's fantastic. Let's look briefly at each of these four words, okay? Each of these four words we want to look briefly at. And, and what we're going to see by this is we're going to see... The godly, a godly approach to raising kids. So parents take notes, grandparents take notes, all right? If you're single and, <clears throat> and, and not married, but you hope one day you're going to be married and you're going to have kids, take notes, okay? If you know somebody who needs to hear this, take notes, all right? Jesus grew in wisdom. The Greek word for wisdom is Sophia. It's just like the girl's name, Sophia. It is the capacity to understand so you can act wisely. What's the difference between wisdom and just being smart? With wisdom, you also have this capacity to know and to act. So so wisdom takes us a step beyond just knowing. Wisdom has to do with action. Proverbs chapter 1, the book of wisdom. If you're not familiar with Proverbs, I want to introduce you to it. The book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son and the king of Israel. David is widely regarded as the wisest man who ever lived other than Jesus himself. Verse 1, these are the, uh, I'm sorry, verse 2, their purpose, what's the purpose of these Proverbs? To teach people wisdom and discipline to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives. Anybody here want to be successful at what you do? Huh? Anybody any of you here want to be successful at your work? You want to be successful in your relationships? You want to be successful at life? 
Proverbs is your textbook. You know, there was a day in America where the Bible sat right alongside all the other textbooks. And the Bible was used in English, in science, in mathematics, all the way across the board. Still true in some countries. I was in Kenya a few years ago, and when I told them that the Bible was basically banned from the, educa- the public education system, they were shocked, the teachers in Kenya. They looked at me and they said, well, this one lady, I'll never forget this, she said, what do you teach? What? Without the Bible, what do you teach? She was right. School's not going to do it, mom and dad. It means you're going to have to every day. They're getting input every day. That's why they got to get biblical input every day to counter that. Um, That verse continues, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. Do you want your children to grow wise? Do you want your children to be successful? Do you want your children to be just, to be righteous, to be fair? Oh, what a world would we live in if everyone was following that prescript that we find here in Proverbs. That's what it means to be wise. If you have not read the book of Proverbs yet, or you've not read all of it, start today. Start today. Read a chapter a day. There's 31 chapters in Proverbs. You can read through the whole book of Proverbs in one. And by the way, read it often. If you haven't read it in a year, that's way too long. you got to break it out again. Okay, there is so much wisdom in that book for you and for your family. Maturity, he grew in maturity. This has to do, this, this word literally means physical size. So he's, he's talking about Jesus getting older and taller and stronger. Let me ask you, parents, are your children getting good exercise? I, I, I love soccer. Actually, I can't stand soccer. But I love soccer as a sport for children to play. All right, because if they know nothing about soccer and they're no good at soccer whatsoever, they still have to run up and down this big field over and over again, and it's fantastic exercise. That's why soccer, I think, I, I would encourage all parents to put their little kids in soccer, right? They just may, may find out they're pretty good at it, you know? I mean, be sure your kids are getting plenty of exercise, okay? Are they eating healthy? Are you watching your children's diet, right? Um, It's very, very important. Almost all kids should have less sugar and less salt. (laughs) Almost all adults should have (laughs) less sugar (laughs) and less salt, all right? But those are, I mean, if you want to focus on just two things, that's two things to focus on. Less sugar, less salt, all right? And more water. Most of America is dehydrated. We need more water. Think four bottles a day, all right? Think four bottles a day and you'll be well on your way. Um, Are you putting limits on screen time? Time in front of a screen. In 2015, the average senior in high school was on social media four hours a day. Younger teenagers were on even more. Studies have found a direct link between the number of hours you are on social media and a lack of empathy. Being on social media for too long means after a while it affects your ability to care about anybody else. Very, very important. Very important. There's not many things I agree with China about, for the record their government I'm talking about, not the people of China who are beautiful and are treated so poorly by their government. They came out this week and and are limiting video games to three hours a week. And they're controlling it as a government, which is what China does, okay? Now, I don't like their methods, but that's not a bad standard to shoot for. Three hours a week between social media and games for children. Now I'm cutting now. This all has to do with our renovation, by the way. I mean, we have new microphones and everything. Once we get the new wiring done, that this cutting out will all go away. Um, screen time has a direct impact on children developing ADHD, especially in the first two years of life. 
So if you're a parent who puts a phone in front of your little kid to keep him from crying, I, I just want I, I, I to tell you, you've got to stop doing that. Okay? When you go out to eat together, parents, don't be sitting there on your phones. Model for your children good family social behavior. Put the phones up. You're not going to miss anything, I promise you. And talk to each other. Show your kid, kids how to interact with one another. Teach them how to communicate. It's so basic, folks, but we've lost it. Our country has lost it. Wrapping up. Are your children maturing in a biblical sense? Are they growing in favor with God? Simply this. Um, are you reading a children's Bible to your kids every day? As they learn to read, are you allowing them to read to you every day? As they become teenagers, are you taking time to sit down with them and pray over them? And here's the thing. Here's the thing. I invite parents to pray over their children. And this includes older kids, adult children who are still at home, okay? Every day before you leave the house. Parents, if you leave before the kids and you grab that kid, you put a hand on their shoulder and you say a blessing over them and pray for them, pray to protect them, pray that they'll be a leader, that they'll not be followers and get themselves in trouble, and then love you, head out the door, goodbye. Takes about 30 seconds, okay? I invite all of you to do this. It will make a massive difference in the lives of your children. Growing in favor with God and in favor with people. And in favor with people, I'm just going to refer you to 1 Corinthians 13. I like it from the message version. It's really very uh, interesting uh, the way the message puts it. But if you want to see the characteristics of somebody who will grow to be great relationally with other people, just read through 1 Corinthians 13 together with your teenagers. Read through 1 Corinthians 13 together with um, your adult children. And just ask the questions back and forth. Hey, does this describe you? Could you insert your name in place of love? Daniel is patient. Daniel is kind. <laughs> Whoops, need some work there. I invite you to do that. With that, we're going we're gonna to close. Um, Mike, I'm going to invite you back up here and uh, uh, as I close us up in prayer. Father God, thank you, Lord, for this time together. Lord, thank you for your word. And uh, God, um, now we just give this time to you. And uh, Lord, um, I pray, I just pray for all my brothers and sisters who are here and all my brothers and sisters online who can connect to small groups through the Church Center app we talked about earlier, that every single adult, Father, will get into a small group. That's my prayer, Lord. I want 100% participation because, God, we want to love each other well, and this is the best.